<clears throat> okay, okay, starting right here. Uh, so April 9th meeting, I'm using a new computer here, so I'm actually d getting a decent recording on Voco screen right now. And on our fast internet line, the new internet, that's we get fiber now, so everything is good and really crisp on this side here. Uh, can you all hear me still? Are you Sorry, can you all hear me? I, I didn't hear that. Sounds good to me. Okay. Sounds great. Sounds great. This is verifying. Yep. Sounds good here too. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So let's get going on a, a meeting. So April 9th. Um, here's a different computer here. Let's paste the developer graph real quick if I can do that. Okay, so there we are. Um, so I've got a few, few updates on several things. So, so working on production engineering of the three printers, my main deal right now, looking into that in a deep way, and also moving forward on the, so on an incentive challenge, OSC incentive challenge, on the use of the 3D printer to make a professional grade cordless drill. Now that's going to be a big one. That's in the planning stage, but that's, that will is a lot of attention and try to go at an idea of simple product that really shows that open develop can work. So very good showcase of leveraging the full collaborative development methods and getting a real product and starting enterprise from that as a direct outcome because we designed it for that and designed it for maximum collaboration. So that's um, pretty excited about that. And that requires a lot of um, integration of what we have so far on many fronts with 3D printing and uh, pushing limits of the universal access to, also to other, other tools because this, this can evolve into, um, as promised, the open source mic factory, the whole thing with torch tables, heavy duty machining, precision machining, uh, starting with 3D printing and moving on forward. So let's get, let's dive into the details. Um, one thing I've actually been thinking about is, uh, and I actually want to do this because, for example, if I want to do 3D printing from scraps, we want to have uh, serious grinders, right? So that's the per case for a torch table. And in a simple impl implementation of torch table, take a look at this. So on page two, I share my screen here as I uh, keep going here. Hold on just a sec. So the torch table has been, an, you know, we've used it first in the 2010 2011 production of tractors where we built four tractors. We cut out all the wheel plates and everything else. Um, let me share my screen. A long time ago, and then we've been sitting around with a torch table uh, several times with several boarded attempts. Uh, we, we got back to it last year with the universal access using the one-inch access system, which has worked great. It's a good simplification. It allows us to do an easy build of the uh, mechanical system. And now we're going forward to some, some more details. Let's see, let me see if somebody... Um, there's a bit, there's a bit of noise back there. <clears throat> Let's see if you guys want, want to mute yourself. I'm hearing some feedback from somebody else. Um, okay, that sounds much better. Um, but the idea being. Uh, one inch universal axis and not on a full flush torch table, but torch table that, that works from flat sheet, flat, not flat sheet, but, but bar stock up to like 12 inches or 18 inches. So you basically can bear roll in a, um, the work piece into the, the structure and it's a, it would be a great, um, great application of quick, you know, quick prototype while testing all the other systems in it, like like how you do the gas delivery, automatic turn on, and, and then still using a simple tool chain like Marlin, where Marlin is uh, robust enough to do an application like a torch table, uh, and it can also get you uh, height control, but in the case of a small small work area, like basically one foot wide, you don't need that, because it's uh, you can manage that easily by hand. So, let me see, I'm going to share my screen there. 
That doesn't look like it. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am here. So, um, just going to the D3D CNC torch table. Just, just so you can take a look at that. Um, so CNC Torch 2019 is the wiki page. And so, so essentially a linear table. And motivation there being immediate use case for grinder metal parts. Like grinder, the, the basically the, the knife, the blades, which are going to be made out of half-inch steel. Uh, the report from, if you follow Precious Plastic, they're working on the next version, which is going to be more heavy-duty. Some of the, the complaints of the current precious plastic grinder was that it wears out and it's small. It is kind of, you can say, flimsy. It's got eighth-inch blades. It's, it's decent, but uh, not, not great. So uh, we can build our own uh, that are much more heavy-duty and, and consistent with what we do is more industrial-grade. But here I was developing some of the, the, the gas control stuff. Uh, so here's the design of the gas flow, so that this would be automatically controlled. So when you're traveling, uh, say you're cutting out with a torch, you're traveling between pieces, you turn the gas off for like eco, you know, fuel savings. So you, you move to a new place, you turn it back on. So it's all automated, so you don't have to worry about it um, in pretty automated fashion. So that's that's design. I just wanted to bring that up as I want to do this pretty soon. Like, I mean, pretty soon, when it's be soon. Uh, we're gonna have the summer school this this July 1st for about a week, so that's that's gonna put on, get put on the calendar be soon. But I was thinking we can do a more experimental thing during the summer school where we're uh, exploring the fullness of the the universal axis. So one, starting with a 3D printer, uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to actually prototype this or build this beforehand, um, and also getting to the two-inch universal axis because with 3D printed parts, yet pretty low cost if you can um, 3D print that and, and then the expensive parts are things like bushings which are um, brass but if we do the desktop foundry I've been looking into desktop foundry stuff with zinc aluminum alloys with our low temperature melting like 100 C 420 C Celsius uh, you can do a simple electrical furnace and you can literally melt this on a stove top you know, it's uh, on the heat on a burn on your stovetop. But let's get a little more refined and then do like an electric heater element in a closed container. So it's just going to be boring. Very simple. Very simple uh, technique. So you can apply it with 3D printing, like bus PLA uh, casting, um, so that you're getting from the 3D printer straight to metal parts. And that could, for example, if you build a torch table or a well, torch table, not too important, but if you go in two inch and three inch, if you talk about linear motion and, and precise bushings, you can actually cast those, uh, say, out of zinc aluminum alloys, which actually happen to be very good for tribological properties, uh, i.e., as, as uh, <clears throat> linear motion kinds of things that don't wear out. Uh, zinc aluminum is quite good at that. So uh, I'm looking right now at uh, kind of maxing out, just really experimenting with the. Um, with the universal access concepts up to like two inch during the the summer school uh, so i'm really interested so. in the casting stuff yeah that's very yes. interesting get you to the high priority i'd be willing to work on that yeah the idea there is that uh, you know 3d printing and, and plastic is is limited in some ways by plastic even though it's extremely useful and you can say essentially that 30 percent of civilization is on plastic it's like there's plastic there's steel and there's yeah. ceramic as the three main component of civilization and on top of that is, is biomass and organic stuff like organic food and trees and things but plastic is huge and metal is like the next my front it gets to the industrial age and if you look at actually on um, thingiverse there's a lot of little 3d printed um solenoid engine like things that if you can start printing those in, in metal or gain to the metal by say say PLA, lost PLA casting or things like that. You can talk about small power devices like small steam engines. That's, that's what's going to make uh, soil concentrate electric quite feasible and practical. So uh, so even though the Thingiverse stuff in plastic is kind of like toys, it's great from my perspective in the sense that it really opens up people mi people's minds that, okay, these things can move just with like little solenoids, but then you add that add on top of that and you're going to get real power 
So that at least gets people introduced to the concept, hey, that, you know, like steam engines actually work. Well, in fact, if you look at, uh, it's called, what is it called? Um, cyclone power. Um, you make steam engines, modern steam engines that are more efficient than any any gasoline engine. So, so I mean, that's not that the technology at all. That's why part of the global village construction set so concentrators and steam engines are part of that. So, okay, so that's kind of um, the tour table part. Cutting out to start that started with the making of plastics so we can have um, the ability to print large things. So that allows us to scale up the the. Um, the size of the things we print because it's going to get really expensive unless we're making our own from scrap that's like then it's literally like free okay next next topic is uh so this is from the, just a little report from the west wrap up festival but i met a guy there who does this this is a linear bearing that's 3d printed it's got metal balls and 3d printed parts around that and i would say plain amazing i mean this works to about two um two thousandths uh, accuracy in terms of like linear glide, I can literally glide um, like a hundred pounds in this thing right here. Well, this one, this specific one here, I think he's showing. He could float like it was either ten or a hundred pounds, but it was very significant and smooth. Like it really works. Bearings plus plastic, you can linear uh, motion um, equipment, which is like wow. This is really pushing the state of what of, of what three D printing does. So that's awesome. I just wanted to bring that up because that will probably uh, be quite useful for us in other applications. Let's check out hydrostatic bearings. This, uh, they have a very interesting property. They do motion that's higher accuracy than the parts of which they're made, which is the opposite of rolling element bar. Uh, uh, hydrostatic. So, so, so that, hydrostatic. Sounds, that sounds like air bearings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, aerostatic bearings are a uh, hydrostatic bearing that uses air. Yep. But you can use oil or, or, or water too. Yeah, yeah and then and that. that that is also accessible. So, so the guy Dan Gelbar, if you look on the wiki, um, there's uh, you can make those air bearings using. Um, there's pretty decent information on it actually. So, Dan Gelbar, if you look on the wiki, he has a video about, on how to do that. With, so, with air, it's pretty low viscosity. Right. The gaps in between the parts tend to be kind of small. If you lose, if you use a higher viscosity liquid, you can have larger gaps. The parts can be made to lower tolerances. Yeah. Yep. That's what. And in this video on a wiki here, page called Dan Gelbart, he showed how to make the very super precise version of it. And it shows you how that kind of a length system is made. You use uh, actually a slab of granite, which is the most precise kind of a thing. So that, that, that slab there, that's granite, that's where the, the components are mounted to. Um, okay, but that's that's really cool. The, um, but to make them out of plastic would be a little more interesting. Okay, it's putting all the work into its bearings. Yeah. I don't know if we can do that with plastic, but I mean, it's getting close. Like, I mean, seeing these linear bearings like this, and then what else is possible? Okay, so moving next to, to planetary gears. So this is stepper motor with small planetary gear, and this would be relevant for us if we want to do gear down a small form factor for standard. This is a NEMA 17, a tiny motor that we use on a 3D printer. So if you put a gear down on it, this happens to be a 3x, 3 times gear down. Uh, but if you do that, you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of backlash. What you really want is the you can. Uh, harmonic, harmonic gears. Yeah, the their backlash issues to be worked out. If you can do it right, you can. Backlash is not as important, such as a uh, simple grinder or just plain lane motion where you don't care about it. That would be good. It would be good for the grinder. Imagine a stacked. So if you click on stacked, here, um, think about. So I started thinking, okay, what if you start with that and go larger, 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 okay. Uh, if you get about 30x gear down, that's enough almost for... 30x gear down would be enough to draw the current implementation of a, a press plastic grinder, shredder. So think about that. So look at this, like you have a small gear, gear down. On top of that, you've got a bigger one and a bigger one up to the one, one inch X shafts and so forth. So uh, point is... Uh, there's videos on YouTube where gears like this and larger sizes, you know, people are pulling cars with those using like little uh, cordless drills, you know. So it's pretty good, good stuff. Um, and like Archimedes said, if you give me a long enough to afford to put it on, I can move the world. That's that's the principle. Um, yeah. yeah. So cool stuff. That means we can um, access high torque applications and various things. You first you have to watch out. Um, 
for backlash and there's uh, ways to perhaps address that in there if, if you do it it gets into the part where it's like you're you're going from just something that you do and it works marginally to refining it to potentially get um, very low back, right? backlash techniques to do it or just do backlash correction if that's regular uh, so there, there's indication that, that can be made quite um, quite applicable to many many things that we do okay um, so I'll just talk about last stuff so talking about uh, printer production engineering so currently we cut up the printer out of um, four by eight sheets of plastic uh, plastic metal metal sheets um, take a look at this if you have so this thing about optimization so the, the cool thing here this frame thing optimization stuff is that what you see there is zero waste so every part is used okay so what we have there is 16 inch 14 inch 12 inch 10 inch 10 and 8 inch frames and the inner cutouts of the latter ones here are used as the heated beds for the 3d printers so think about each printer frame has got six pieces six flat pieces that are but together before we're welding now we can also welding or um, bolting through corner pieces so i'm still working on that but take a look at this for 14 um like a 16 inch can get you a 12 inch print bed 14 12 versions get you eight inch print beds a 10 inch gets you a six inch print bed in terms of what can fit in there so that would be a d3d mini and then uh an eight inch Inner piece gets you a micro D3 micro. How about that? Four inch print bed. Now, is four inch print bed any good? Well, there's a lot of printers out there that actually do do that. And uh, five inches seems to be like the minimum practical version where, like, MakerBot, um, Ultimaker, they have like five inch printers. The the mini for Lowe's bot, that's six inches. But even if you go to four inches, I mean, you can print so many different things with. So I was thinking, okay, well, the set of frame that we have. Then a sheet of 4x8 gets you three sets of 8-inch frames, too. Um, so if we do do that, that means we're not throwing out those pieces. We use the, even as little as the 8-inch size frames. And that gets us 15 frames from one sheet, including six beds if we make our own heated beds. Um, and then have to get like nine heated beds of the eight inch size which are which we would get from elsewhere but this is really cool because like open source ecology eco is important so we have a case here where there's absolutely zero material waste except for the little cutouts of holes that are used for bolts so that's like less than one percent waste of um, full sheet of steel which is good let's talk about the critical path so thinking about where where you want to go for the viral replication or very much widespread applicability of our 3d printer so right now we're at the eight inch printer the six inch printer is um i'm gonna do that next with a 10 inch frame um once again because i've got all these frames here that are stockpiling that from from a run the sprint, uh, builds i mean we typically worked with the 12 the 14 16 inch frames 14 for most part not even the 12 so i've got a bunch of 12s and 10s here so let's start using that because i mean you don't want to think about it you don't want to be inefficient and just waste that especially if you can make useful printers out of that so that just means a little more work in designing the different size versions of the printer so so as critical path which is you can look at on a on a wiki what makes sense right now is we've got the eight inch printer uh, then we go to six inch we can go to four inch for the micro for the micro printer so six inch mini and then go back to the what is this 14 inch frame printer not sure what that's but that's i don't know what i did there okay uh, but with a six inch printer we also want to go a couple of things we want to improve on is right now our system is at 12 volts we probably want to go to 24 volts for faster but heating and less current through wires so that's a good design uh still want to do like a better like wiring box and, and three printed electronics panel so you don't have to cut like drill all those holes for the components but just 3d print that no problem uh we want to do inspired by Lowe's dot next here in line is dual lift heads what's that mean um dual lift heads so dual head printer for two materials at least Lowe's dot at the midway prep right there has showcased their two head printer where one head moves out of the way through a little circle so that's open source available and we can pick that off from Lowe's bot, which is great. Um, 
Now, to the 12 inch printer, that's the 12 inch bed printer that will be next. And let's add the, not only the volcano, the super volcano to that. So I got a super volcano here. The nozzle, that's pretty expensive, but it gets you 20 pounds per day of printing. So that means large, large parts, uh, construction materials. Um, stackable heater blocks would also allow us to, when we talk about construction set, when we go to the super volcano because it's so expensive, um, to the tune of $150 just for the heater block. That's as much as some of the cheap Chinese printers. Kind of unacceptable for where we are. So let's do stackable heater blocks where uh, also the kind of stuff that J-Head is doing is relevant for us. So we've got J-Head uh, heater blocks. That's the other open source heater block. They don't do threads, which like if you do super large heater blocks, you have a lot of threads inside of them. They actually do clamp-on stuff. We can consider clamp-on design. I was thinking about clamp-on design of heater blocks, um, where one of the issues with screwing on is that you gotta, you can never end at the correct angle. Actually, one of the, the issues for, pr for production engineering side on our side, uh, if you screw in the, the heater element, the heater block, it's kind of random where you get it at the right spot, and that's a little bit of an issue. You need to look that out. So actually, the clamp on uh, heater blocks would allow you, us to bypass that. Details that's technical development needs to happen. Uh, so now, with the 12 inch, let's go to 24 inch and the 36 inch. Uh, I would call 24 inch that, that would also have super volcano <laughs> and larger and then larger than super volcano for even faster printing, like up to like super volcano 80 watts. How about? 120 watts for OSC when you have like three volcanoes stacked in a row. Call it the thermite nozzle for 36 inch 3D printer. How do you like that? Thermite, if you know what that is, that is high heat. So now we can call it the OSC thermite nozzle. <laughs> I kind of like that because that's extreme. Um, so next here's planetary gear downs that might be relevant for lunch axes so if we have heavier things to move around like like not super precise requirement for a cnc torch table you can do planetary gear downs on the standard step steppers that we use nema 17. the last year we did nema 17 with the big five to ten foot 3d um torch table and that was acceptable we had actually four we used four of them on the y axis and two of them on the x axis they were enough to move the move the torch table fine. Not a problem, because you don't even move so fast on the torch table. Like if you're cutting like half inch seal, that's pretty slow. 20 inches per minute or so. Uh, so we got the one inch rod universal axis for applications like your, your torch. And when we're at that level, let's design that for handling a welder. So that means you have 3D printing and metal. So that means you're going to have to hide the moving parts so they're not exposed to spatter. But the, the one inch universal axis tour table slash metal 3D printer that gets you to hot, hot metal. Yes, that's where we want to go. That will be one inch immediately doable with the universal axis. We've got all the technology uh, that's just waiting to be done. Then we could make parts for the filament maker, the shredder. Shredder the blades. Yes, definitely the blades on the shredder. Half inch. Um, if you look at Google Shredder blades, see what they look like. That's similar to what it looks like on the uh, precious plastic shredder, but heavier duty. And then we get filament production. That's obviously a brand of filament made from all kinds of waste. Um, you guess where the word comes from. And then we move on to large prints such as two inch universal axes. Um, there's somewhere in there is the desktop 3D printing foundry where that would get us precise motion components like the bushings, two inch and three inch bushings. So that's that's where like this desktop foundry would be very important. Uh, because a single bushing at the level like three inch is like, I don't know, 20 bucks. And we need like, I don't know, like 20 of them. It's like 400 bucks that we can do for like five dollars or under in material if we can make it ourselves. So that's kind of what I'm seeing for the three printer stuff. Like there must be done parts in that. Aside from the bushings, same, same, sorry, pretty much, right? 
Well, if you use the universal axis, the claim to name of the universal axis is at 14 parts for the entire motion system. The, the bearings, or the precise motion part in there, is just the bearing outside of the belt. So that's it. See the universal axis put on the wiki. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay, let's move on. That's my report. Uh, I tied it about this stuff and, and make it all happen to the point that we can apply this whole ecology of uh, technology that's open source, relying on the waste stream. So, so what you notice, like in uh, on state number six, um, here we're talking about, uh, okay, OSC stands for industrial product being on a small scale, but it's also eco, uh, made for local and recycled materials, like I said in my TED talk. But here we have the capacity to take metal, um, plastic for scrap, and then like aluminum from the scrap, aluminum and zinc, and then we've got metal and plastic infrastructure here that we can be building from. So it's pretty good. It gets us pretty close to the full power of metal uh, metal technologies. But that's like metals for, like steel would be more like the induction furnace. That's higher tech, clean, clean stuff, high power. Uh, but in the interim, we can do some of this lower melting temperature metals that are doable in a simple device like a, like a desktop melting device that's powered by a, a kiln, kiln heater so which get you up to those kind of things can get you up to about 1300 celsius which is almost enough for steel but it actually is enough for steel if you talk about not steel but cast iron or ductile iron i was looking at that those things melt at 1200 celsius so we can be getting to the iron using still this desktop foundry like the beginning of that and then the full-fledged stuff goes with induction furnace that's like a little beyond this desktop level uh, but that's, we could do a little that's, little induction furnace or something you can also do a very small induction furnace so if you have regular feedstock so so the latest concept on the if you talk about full-fledged metal foundry um, the best idea would be to make regular stock like billet, for example, three inches in diameter. If you have that, you can have a small, tight induction furnace with this like three inch ring that can melt that three inch billet if that is your feedstock. So design it around simple feedstock like three inch, which is your billet, and then you can go from that to anything. Like you can roll that into plate. You can. Uh, do whatever you need from that and melt that down into casting or whatever so yeah the induction furnace you can do induction furnace on a very small scale the question there is you have to have some if it's a very small induction heater you can do things like you know like one rods maybe but you know there's not a lot of metal in there and pretty then you can even melt them um they do have an example of a thing where they have a 3d printer where it's an induction heater melting wire to dribble dribble molten metal which makes your 3D print. That's there's some experimental stuff around that. Uh, commercial stuff similar to that uses more advanced technology, which is like they do induction plus some effects where the magnetic fields in there direct the metal out of the nozzle. That's like called magnetohydrodynamics. That's kind of like this plasma physics stuff, but that's more complicated. Um, for us, we're fine with um, as far as for now for metal printing the, the brute force. And well, they're high fee printing, which um, every time I see these big windmill towers around here, I think we can do that. I mean, we're talking about those one megawatt or four megawatt tur turbines, perfect application for three D printer that does mig, mig welding and it basically makes the the tower by going round and round up and up until it does that. That's the kind of thing that we can look forward to eventually. Because those those kinds of towers, they're very expensive. And, and if you look at the price of building wire, it's actually only a dollar pound. So big tower for a big windmill, I haven't done, I haven't really costed out a big windmill tower. I know it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I think we can actually do cheaper if we do that with a welder uh, 3D printed tower. Uh, it seems like that because you avoid transportation costs if the welding wire is like a dollar a pound i think it'd get competitive i don't know i have to look more into that yeah electricity is going to cost a lot too and also time 
You take a long time. Electricity yeah. is a minor part. I did those did those numbers. It's it's like small part. It's under five percent of that. It's the yeah. it's the yeah yeah. Let's see. I I did that recently. Let's see, do I have that on my the time too? Because the volume process is okay. yeah, but the, the but you're talking about minute. Uh, oh. correct. But you're talking about robots doing that for you. You're not doing that. You're going to sleep, and uh, and the 3D printer is working for you. So let's see. I mean, uh, 3D printed windmill, windmill. Oh yeah, here we go. 3D printed windmill tower on the wiki from March 29. Um, okay, yeah. 250 kilowatt wind turbine tower, so smaller than the giga the megawatt scale. But larger than what's in the GVC, which is 50 kilowatts, which is what we initially proposed. Uh, and I'm thinking we should go more than 50 kilowatts because. Uh, but I think a lot of it must be because it's. Ch uh, don't have that. I can't find it on the 250 kilowatt windmill towers page. Well, there's some numbers there. Um, but a tower, what we do know, for example, for a 250 kilowatt turbine, a tower weighs about 16,000 pounds. Um, if you do it with a welder, it will take you 1,000 hours with one welder, so you have to have multiple welders. Um, so if you have uh, five welders running on this in a robotic way, that's eight days per tower for a 250 kilowatt tower. So it's, that's some crazy stuff. But um, I don't think it's not doable. Uh, the largest 3D print comes from, uh, so that some people in Scotland, I think, are working on that. And the largest parts that were ever printed were like 30 feet long. Um, it's on the wiki somewhere. But looking at it, what's, what's the largest thing that people print with MIG, MIG welders as 3D printed parts? So this is an example of this long structural member that they printed, which was like 30 feet and weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. So it's not such a far cry. But anyway, that's, that's getting us a little ahead of ourselves. Um, so let's move forward. So let's um, we'll wrap up with that. So let's let's uh, hear more from others. So uh, please go ahead. Um, let's see, Eric, do you want to update us on how it went this weekend? Sure. Um. So this weekend was kind of my big event, um, the MSU Expo, yeah. which is part of um, the Science Festival. So it's a campus-wide event <clears throat> with um, hundreds of uh, like presenters and people um, spell across the campus and uh, tens of thousands of visitors. So um, I was in the uh, Expo area, um, and we had several hundred people come by. Um, talked with uh, over 100 plus people. Um, so, nice. yeah, people are very interested in, uh, you know, moving machines and seeing stuff that's generated. Mm -hmm. um, so, it was uh, primarily families with uh, younger kids. Um, yeah. I was kind of surprised that uh, a lot of the kids were familiar with 3D printing. Mm -hmm and uh, had done some at school. Um, usually they just had a like class assignment for a week where they worked on a model and then they have to print one thing. Mm -hmm. um, the printers weren't um, available otherwise. Yeah. So um, several kids, uh, a handful of kids were pretty interested in it. Um, mm -hmm. That they had Tinker, they got Tinkercad on their own, um, and then there was one kid that had his own 3D printer. Um, so it's definitely an interest, kind of a gamification or toys or something. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, kids wanted print Legos. <laughs> There's lots of that. Um, so it was good for me overall because it kind of gave me a deadline to get my printer working. Um, I'll put up some pictures of the, the display we had. Um, people were less familiar with concept of open source, um, but they were interested in the idea. 
Um, and they would like the idea that they could, you know, download OSC Linux and um, have the software or just get the software on their own. Mm -hmm. So um, my suggestion and to the parents was, uh, you know, they can get either Tinkercad for free or FreeCAD. Um, and we do have some 3D print facilities at public libraries here. So I suggest they look into it. Um, and I actually submitted um, the D3D uh, nozzle assembly um, to the school library and the local library for printing. Um, the local library got back to me and they printed it and I mentioned to them um, you know, that I was kind of interested in doing a class or something. Um, so I'm kind of trying to get contact with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think uh, my initial step would be to just introduce the idea of um, being able to use the software on your own and use a print facility. Mm -hmm. they, you said they, so they're printing it, what, the, the MK2 Prusa style, what do we use the, for OC, the, the, yeah. the extruder part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I submit that to them from the yeah. website. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll go over there tomorrow and pick it up and see what their quality like and have a chance to talk to the librarian um, STEAM coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's kind of what happened the last few days. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think I, you know, I collected contact information of um, people that are interested in getting their own printer or learning my... Um, so I'm going to follow up yep. with uh, an email, um, laying out different options, you know, from just uh, working with the local print facilities to, um, you know, getting a D3D and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, and let us know what happens with that and follow up. Yeah, so I'm uh, looking in the future, um, you know, chances of doing a DVD workshop. Um, and, you know, if there would be some sort of speaker series that would um, be applicable for this, um, but that would likely be in fall semester. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Uh, were you printing stuff at, at Deco or just showcasing them to or? Uh, it was rocking, um, so I was just printing little cubes and a octopus. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had a whole bunch of practice octopuses that kids uh, took home with them, mm -hmm. so uh, that's fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we had a few technical issues that we could um, maybe discuss. Mm -hmm. So I uh, like turned on the printer uh, and boot up. OSC Linux, everything had been working fine earlier in the week, but of course, you know, we got to use stuff and mm -hmm. uh, not quite working right. So it was very strange. Um, I had like a scaling issue, so usually I do a min cylinder queue as my like practice print to make sure that the axis is owned and everything. Um, everything was scaled 10 times larger. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure why that would happen. Yeah. Um, have you ever had run into that? Okay. <laughs> no. No, but but a right document that uh, Okay. So, let's see, I mean where do you document it? So there's D three D data collection or three D printer okay. data collection. Let's see what's, what's on that page. Um So, yeah, this goes to three printer logs. Feel free to po post it up there. I'm basically uh, like logging for a log. It's, it goes to 3D print data collection, goes to 3D print log. So we're just putting down all kinds of uh, what, what's happening in different prints and issues and things like that. 
feel free to put it up there but make sure you just write down specific of exactly what you're using with printer version and, and software and all that so you know what that is but no sure. i haven't, haven't heard that one that that kind of deal yet um, like scaling issues so much not not, not very yeah. printing yeah yeah it's very strange my uh cube uh started to come out pretty big <laughs> yeah and uh you know i could change the scale um that you would usually use to transfer an object in Cura, mm -hmm. and if I took it down to one tenth size, it was normal. But uh, mm -hmm. the uh, like finding the bed on mm -hmm. in the printer itself was then kind of thrown off. Mm -hmm. um, but so I just went back to default settings and had tweaked the G code. Just put in the bed auto leveling um, was the one thing missing from default G code. Um, and then everything um, more or less went fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yep. Um, so, yeah, um, then uh, the axes and everything's working pretty well. Um, the extruder, um, it, it works most of the time, but uh, my filament may be picking up a little bit of dust or something, um, so sometimes I get uh, jams or um, you know stop getting filament flow. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, so I'm just gonna try to update, uh, upgrade the the extruder and do a couple of practice ones to get a yeah a good. Well, the yeah. the track record on the Prusa extruder is that we never got it to work. The only way it would work is if we never turned on the the retraction, which means you get stringy. So, I don't know. Um, I I'd say um, move right on to the the Titan Arrow. You can get decent clones of that for like fifty bucks or so. Um, the the full fledged version costs like a hundred ten bucks for the the Titan Arrow. Get clones for about 50, and as long as you have uh, just the one trick on those is make sure you get a clone that's got a metal drive wheel, so and that should work. And I don't know if they uh, we got a clone or two. We ran into the issue with the plast. I, I didn't even run the clone. Actually, never even assemble a clone which had the plastic drive gear. It should be metal should not be plastic because that's going to wear out after some time. Um, okay. But you can get the metal ones if the kit doesn't come with it, but obviously there's kits out there that, that do come with it. Because I, I noticed this initially when you can see the stuff changing from China really quickly. So like last year when we were getting the Titan Arrows, the ones on, on AliExpress were all crappy clones. Uh, a few months after that, they started making them with the real metal wheel, metal drive wheel. So that's available right now. So I think it will work. I never tried it yet. I actually will try that. See if the clone does work, because it's you know it's after all most of the part of the same. And there might be like some some defects on a little detail somewhere. But that's 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 what you get if you don't have the the authentic one. But I think the authentic one uh, may not necessarily be necessary. Uh, now. As far as the longer term evolution on our side here, part of this uh, on the roadmap on slide number six didn't really talk about the, fill, the, the extruders, but it's kind of implied in a scalable stackable heater blocks on step six. But if we're doing stackable heater blocks, that means we're kind of starting to hack into the extruder and actually starting to make our own. And we can do that. The D3 CNC circuit mill capable of milling aluminum, so we can do that definitely, and it's it's about time we should start that. Um, I think D3D circuit mill is one of those things. I mean, it's uh, my paper published on it. It works great. Uh, we just start using it, and getting familiar with it to work work out things like making our own extruders just from a little box of aluminum. So that'll be good. Um. So uh, another question about a possible upgrade. So I. I bought a larger heat bed um, yep. that I want to install at some point. Yeah. So I think um, gluing, you know, gluing the heat bed right to the to axes, um, you know, kind of prevents you from being able to repair and upgrade. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm 
looking at, I think maybe the, this heat had come with two holes in it. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, just gluing a piece of um, metal that has you know, screw holes mm -hmm. um, would be an nice upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And then, so this heat bag is larger and it comes with um, dual power layers. Um, would you need two MOSFETs or would you just hook up those two wires to the same MOSFET? Connection. Now, if it's dual yeah, power, is it intended to be used at the same dual, like 12 and 24? Uh, I'd have to look that up. Yeah, the devil's in the details on that, but no, you'd probably yeah. want to use either one or the other. I was okay. looking at that, and, and I'm still not clear. It seems there's indication that if you use the regular, well, this is for an 8 inch bed, so you're talking about a 12 inch bed? For the 8 inch, you can run 24 volts through the, tw the 12 volt connections, which will get you four times the power. That's, that's the deal question. Can that handle it for fast heating times? I'm going to try that. Now, for your case, um, you're going to need probably a larger, I don't know if you might need a larger power supply. I don't know if ours is going to do it. Um, Depends. Depends what you're doing. If you're running it on 12, depends what the amperage is. If it's like 16 amps for the bed, yeah, you can do it. At like 200 watts, but it'll be somewhat okay. slow heating, not super fast, but acceptable. Um, so the other thing here, doing with the construction set approach here, like if you go to the five, four, five, um, four or six inch beds or the 12 inch beds, we just will take. Uh, coated nichrome wire and, and just want that ourselves because uh, it'll get us the flexibility of making any size printer bed run off nichrome wire uh, so we don't have to worry about stocking like 4 inch, a 6 inch, an 8 inch, and a 12 inch bed so that, that's where we want to go eventually. Now these uh, nichrome wire um, that's fine to do it at, at 120 volts so you get a high voltage Thing that would be heat up really fast like but I do believe it's it's important because uh, for you ability or speed it's like it's the time you waste isn't about heating up so yeah um, that's a definite worthwhile feature to have that heat up in like 30 seconds if you use you know, okay. volts uh, for later but for now yeah you're fine with a uh, single single MOSFET just make sure you it's no more than 16 amps otherwise you need a better power supply Sure, I'll take a closer look at the specifications and put up the um, exact model that I have. Yep. That's yep. good, that's good. Um, improvement on that. Um, yeah, I was just looking at the heat beds yesterday and, and uh, I want to start playing around with, with coated nitro wire. Like uh, heating, let's see, nitro wire on the wiki. Nitro wire. I, I, did, I put some information on it. There's a bunch of, bunch of sourcing there where if you get Teflon coated wire, um, they have wire that's coated, so it's not you don't doesn't shock you, right? Uh, but those, yeah. But those ones, well, yeah, you have you have to do insulation around those, like the heat yeah. is insulated. Uh, so, if, and it's not it's important at 24 volts, but 120 volts is going to give you a shock. So, so here, for example, we have Teflon coated. The the max temperating on it is 250 C. So that'll be fun because you typically want to go. I mean, the biggest we ever. I mean, I've never run it more than like 80 for ABS. I didn't do any more high temperature stuff. This kind of stuff, simple uh, nichrome coated nichrome, is plenty good for making your own beds. And it's just you put that to 120 volts and run that through a relay, just a little relay like one of those. Um, Either like a solid state relay or one of those blue cube relays where you have to, since each of those cubes are typically rated for like 10 amps, well, that's perfectly fine if you're going at 120 volts because you don't want to do more than <laughs> more than 10 amps on 120 volts. That would be like a kilowatt. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, the micro gets you the availability to do that. I was looking at Marlin, and in Marlin, they allow you to do it, like if you read about like the wire just melting because it's got so much power. You can set a different heating mode where it's not the on off, but the modulated stuff, the pulse with modulated stuff, which does very wrap on and off so you don't burn out the bed. You can control that more 
uh, gently tomorrow. And I was just looking at that yesterday. And that's Google. Right now, the system that we run just does the simple on-off for the heated bed. Because the heat bed can only go up to like 120 C max. But if you start playing with, if we start playing with these high power beds, which is going to be definitely needed for the D3 Mega or Giga, like Giga would be, I would call that a three foot one. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of power there. We want to probably make sure that the heating might be more, more suited if we do the finer control with rapid on-off cycling so that you don't burn it out. So just more attention to that later. For now, that's not an issue. Anyway, you do it. Anyway, details. When I'm a little more skilled, uh, maybe I can get into that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. So, uh, uh, Abe, do you want to continue? What you've been up with? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, maybe I should see, share my screen as well. into frame to try to get this uh, frame a little bit more flexible with mounting the, uh, the clamps and the axes. I'm missing your senior scanner sharing. Sharing. like a window on my end. My connection may not be. Yeah, your connection is <clears throat> Does it sound great. So they're just having connectivity issues. Yeah. Um, let's see, can we take a look at did you paste in your log in the log here? Uh, what do we got here? Oh, there. Whoa. Yeah, the, that's, yeah look at that. At least a photo. Uh, yeah. The, from there, I'm, I'm trying to get that close so that. Yeah. Uh, see how these axes are going to fit uh, much better. But yeah. <clears throat> the, when I'd looked at that before, mostly the corners were kind of in the way of those. I think that help. Um, I only guess about those corners is how I, I wonder if they'll have to be printed to be strong enough just in case um, and to uh, have a degradation eventually. But what I've seen is mostly PLA parts. That's what it is, just PLA. Um, but seems oh, well, uh, I mean, there's no major stress design, I guess, but um, sometimes it gets to the PLA, it, uh, it sometimes cracks along, you know, the, the print. In this case, I guess the, the print, uh, what happened, it, uh, the legs wouldn't be 90 degrees, it, they would be at 45 degrees to bed, so the print shape would be... Uh, uh, a little different in the uh, than the angle that it's probably experiencing forces at. Hopefully that that might help with the strength. Um, oh, that was something I looked at too on, on my log uh, before. I was to design that uh, corner. I checked to see if uh, it, how it would print and cure a little bit, and I was kind of having issues whenever I loaded that part of the cure. Uh, it seemed to default to load at an odd angle for some reason, and so I was trying to get it. Because then I said it, it's supposed to be able to print it, it up to 45 degrees. I think that's kind of the recommended limit, right? So, yeah. But I was having a little issue for some reason. It didn't load it either at 90 or it, you know, it, it, it just default loaded at some strange angle, like 59 degrees in one direction. So I was having trouble to figure out where the. Um, the legs would be the correct free five degrees to the bed to print without any warnings, hopefully. But mm, I, I'm not sure what that is to be some kind of cure or thing. Maybe I uh, can look that further. I can't think of any other ways to uh, redesign that part to uh, print better. I guess I, I think that's just have to see what, what the best print settings are for it. So you're saying laying um, it on its tip and it's bolted? <laughs> 
Yeah, on the back end, like it just put put below the bed. Yeah, yeah. Is yep. the flat spot. Um, but the leg should, should end up 45 degrees, which it should, should print okay if I understand. Well, it. it's not. Um, it's not. It's less than less than 45 because there's a three-dimensional thing. If it was just the two two-dimensional, that would be 45. But because there's three of them, that actually lowers that angle a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. Hmm. They're but we should try it. All we should three try it at so. 90 degrees to each other, so... See? Yeah, ideally... It dimensions. Be, but it... 45 degrees to the bed, right? No, um, no, they can't. That's, yeah, you're going from two dimensions to three dimensions. It's one dimension. Yeah. Going, going to the yeah, next maybe. dimension and it turns lower than 45 degrees. Right? Does that okay. That? Yeah, maybe I'm not... <laughs> all right, so... It's yeah, going into the fourth more. dimension. Thing change. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully, hmm. yeah, but it may have to be printed slower than I guess. But yeah, so yeah, we should, we should try it. Worst <coughs> case is you put some supports, which would, you know, mm -hmm. that sucks. But. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, you know, you know, you can print it flat, like just like you have, but then the, yeah, okay, you can't print it flat like you have, but, well, no, no, not with the, yeah, the, the uh, bottom parts of the support missing right there, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, you, could you could put, put supports on yeah, that, yeah. Supports under two legs and then it would, yeah, yeah it would print, you just clean it up. Right, after right. This. Yeah, the ideal is construction printing is you want to design it so you don't have to clean it up because that's labor and, and that's yeah, significant it's labor, yeah. a lot of trouble. Um, it's not, yeah, not a big deal to just do it for yourself, but for production, it's, it's time is money. Yeah, even if you had PVA, uh, with the you pieces, do that. that complicated more than uh, you'd have to put it in the water bath and so on. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to make part. Yeah, no, I think on the good but it is. Tip slow printing as much as you don't have to be there, you can let it go and print. Yeah, totally. You only need eight parts like that for this yeah. style of frame, so right. um, you should be able to print them all in, in one uh, on a fairly small printer. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The 3D micro would do it four inches or less. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think they're. I was trying to say if they were, I hope they're, they're long enough, you know, the side and everything in the legs. I, I, I did it relative to the, um, I guess, the, the previous corner, just based the length off of that. So, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I think it looks it, pretty good. It'll be strong enough, I think, to put it on, you know, what the print settings are, try to do a low infill, you know, that may make it use less material, but at some point the, the weakness might be an issue someday. Um, we stress as a printer somehow, but, uh, let's see, in, so, yeah, I, that plenty of, of freedom range for positioning the clamps and the axes, I think, so I just gotta kind of rework this, uh, whole assembly so that I can see better how the, um, that, that over on top axis, because that seemed like a better design and that would keep things more consistent if you're yeah. doing the printer that way. Right, um, and and it just gives them more more uh, range and general further print options. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's what allows us to use like the small up down to small eight inch frame while getting uh, like a four or five inch print bed, which is great. Very small form factor. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see um, how this uh, might scale up a little more too. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. working on a, uh, a stove to put a uh, printer, uh, hopefully set a shelf in here, and uh, uh, I'd like to be able to scale, scale up something big. Uh, a lot of the stuff I think of that would be useful to print would be like large, simple items, uh, trays, containers, boxes, things like that are often uh, not even necessarily that custom stuff. I guess the problem is when you look at the price of PLA filament, um, it's it's hard to, to do much of that, uh, considering the price of a lot of these cheap injection molded, um, you know, plastic yeah. containers and things like that. 
Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense until you can make your own film and film other things. Yeah, if the film it was really cheap. But I don't think there's stuff that, that uh, like greenhouse, plastic trays, pots, things like that. Mm -hmm. So those containers are kind of, um, well, they, they constantly, you know, break and get, they need to be recycled or something. So, yeah. Uh, and PLA is compostable. I, I, I look online, just look it up to see how uh, long, you know, printed uh, plastics used that way in moist uh, conditions and so on. And, and people said that. Uh, it was a range. It was anywhere from months to, you know, years. People said their, their pots held up pretty well in some cases. Hmm. No, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. What are your next steps here? Um, I need to get the detail on the, uh, the frame on this good... Uh, so that I know exactly what these parts were, but I think I think the range from what I looked at and what I measured before on the uh, full assembly, just moving, getting rid of those corners where I can move the clamp all the way, up should enable me to mimic the uh, axis style uh, of assembly the same way you did on the other printer. So I'm gonna have to just get and, and utilize up with the same parts. I think mostly because before it looked like there were okay. mods. So. Here's Here's one suggestion. If so, you see here. Can you see my? Let me share my screen. Yeah. So here's this. The x-axis, the top axis, is mounting through these these holes. Go into these upper holes on carriage. Um, if you if you want to move the y-axis down so that the clamp does not interfere you can just extend the height of this printed piece here so this this the angle here if you increase the size of the angle piece here you can get get the axis to to basically straddle over the top of the printer without problem so that could possibly do it let's see but the way you have it right now it's oh yeah i mean it's almost no, this will work right um, now, how it is right now. The, yeah, well, I'm something like the, that. I, yeah. I, the constraints, I think, were not working how I thought they were in the, in the file there, and I've got, like, a bunch of clamps. They're not lined up and so on, so I was right. trying to... I'm probably just going to delete some of that stuff and re rework that because it was yeah. giving me trouble there. But um, it should be able to, should be able to move those clamps all the way up to the top if that's ideal. And then uh, see how the yeah how the axes mount the clamps is, could mount the uh, either the bottom part of the axes bolted through the clamp or the top. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what it's more. Let's see, well, let's see. So. Hmm. Well, I guess it's technically. Well, I have to look at it closer, but I guess it's technically to have the axis. Yeah, be be around the. Um, see pipes. Yeah, because the top. I, I guess it's the x-axis. It's as long as it's on the rails. Uh, let's see, on the top rails. Between the top rails, it's it should miss the. Uh, the top of the frame. Yeah, I mean, your one y-axis here sounds pretty good to me. The one on the opposite side, you need to lower it. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. there's... Yeah, yeah, details. Plenty of, plenty of range of motion there, so... Uh, yeah, just getting the parts arranged right. It, it should fit in... Um, position and it may not be uh, clamps might have to be put in some position that it was have to figure out what the measurement is and that could that could be a little an issue with assembly making sure that everything is fairly even um, so to take good measurements and so on okay uh, so let me tell you about that so, so do you understand this piece right here the excess x axis, the, 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 oh, specifically the this piece right here, 
No, no, rather this piece right here. Do you understand the function of that? Uh, let's see, the one on the end with the... Because this relates to alignment. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I don't... I think you were explaining that before. Yeah. I, I did see some pictures that, that showed some actual photos. I think you showed us some assemblies and it made more sense then. That's your um, that's your alignment piece right there. You don't have to have the Y's parallel. You okay? Because the rods go in there, and that's a there's a bearing inside these. This is a oh, yeah. so the rods go in there, so you can have that play like that much play can slide in and out that much, so you can be way off on the Y and still have perfect motion as long as one side is fixed tight. Okay, so, yeah, if it generally lines up with the, um... So yeah, the mounting so, brackets and so on. Yeah, so on the Z-axis, because you've got, you know, as long as they're vertical, like the height on, on Z-legs is not super critical, because, you know, the motion is on these precision Z-rods. Um, mm -hmm. The Y-side to Y-side... The parallelism there is not critical. So this give, has a lot of play for making mistakes. Um, and then you can slide things left and right to get them perfectly vertical on a Z. So that's good, right? That gives you automatic adjustability there. So if you build the frame and it's not completely tight in terms of identical dimensions, that's perfectly acceptable, which is great because um, it's not going to kill it. Like if we didn't build the frame right, in the metal frame with a former like prior to 199 uh, v1902 v1902 added this adjustment block and that's relevant to you eric too if you ever have trouble with parallelism between the y-axis if it gets tight this is the upgrade that required basically a piece that the the rods can slide in and out of take up the not parallel not parallel yeah uh, but that's a that's a great simplification. Otherwise, you have to be very careful that you get them exactly parallel. Otherwise, they'll bind up on you. On uh, uh, it's easier to, for them to not bind up in the middle of motion, but towards the ends where the rods are constrained against the, the plastic pieces, becomes an issue, and you'd get stiff motion. It'll be hard, or you get stuck there. And that's it. <clears throat> um. Yeah. So you just gotta, you know, clean this up a little bit. And like once you have it cleaned up, then then observe the exact range of motion. You can maybe like put make a thing where you can actually move the pieces with everything in place and see how far you actually yeah. can move them. I, I was gonna you said that uh, you had that way before and it should be um I'll just have to assemble different parts in there. I think those are fairly static. So to do a little more detail and um you, yeah you can the details are saved so in the file history say for the x version x axis the earlier versions of that file will have everything mm -hmm. in the detail so you can maybe like take out the carriage or make it movable and save that for the purposes of this design yeah yeah okay, yeah just the carriage should be enough um give some movement there and yeah, I think all the other uh, parts that I think you designed for those, for the other printer should be fairly usable for that now that um, yeah. uh, the axes can be moved up more. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that should solve a lot of the problems with the modifying and other stuff. Yep. That's good. What I like here, as I mentioned last time, is that, yeah, you're pretty much borrowing the pieces for, you're, you're just simply like, reworking the frame and reworking the connections to the frame, but using the same thing as I did for 1902 was good. That's nice to keep uh, part out low if we can. Yep. And uh, that, most of those parts are, are fairly simple. Uh, I think all those parts, uh, the brackets and so on that you've added that are new, I guess they're, they're pretty simple to print. So. They look like yeah. they print up uh, yep. easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good.
yeah, so I guess keep going on this design and yeah, see if uh, start cleaning it up. But yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks quite workable. And the advantage here is that okay, so you can do you're doing a 12 inch burn, and we can modify to whatever size as well. Once we get the once you do this one, people will see okay, this is how it goes all together. Because here now, it's some of the details are not so visible. But once you have a good plate for making different sizes, people can make this in all kinds of sizes, smaller and larger. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how far that will scale. I mean, yeah. I think I'd like the biggest, I would might be able to print as big as two feet. No, no, no. Three I, feet, I, that, I wouldn't, I that's wouldn't. huge, but On that, two well, feet with, yes, with no... Yes, if you it. Mm. Two feet, yes, the, the if you enforce it. The pipes are probably too flexible. That is right. For two gonna, feet is what you yeah, think. Yeah. yeah, definitely. But but then you without some additional right, material. you have to do the concrete or you burn concrete, or whatever. But the PVC is pretty flexible. So, well, I mean, you can do two feet, but you have to go very very slow. Yeah. Okay. Because the force is when this thing moves back and forth. It's inertia. You got like a kilogram in a in a head here. The motor itself is like what is it like? I don't know, three hundred grams or something, or four hundred grams. Uh, it's pretty heavy. I mean, that yeah. head ends up. I mean, imagine <laughs> that thing sm smashing back and forth. That that shakes it around. If you're going fast. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Well, we'll see. I don't know what can be done to lighten those motors up. I suppose that's uh, a different thing. Uh, you can. A bunch you of can, better but... designs where it looks like for some of the industrial stuff, they just try to make the motors all stationary. Or, uh, well, so the end ones are, but the, the other ones stationary as well, which I guess is, uh, I guess I saw some different designs with... Um, I don't know if they're using well, cable I would or say what. It's different. Oh, you can't get away from a stiff frame. you got to have that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 18 inches is pretty big. So maybe with some reinforcement uh, plastic frame um, would be stiff enough for some slowish printing. But we'll see how that does. I guess it depends on, well... I assume you need a certain level of accuracy, even if you don't need a high quality, accurate print part in some cases. Um, you, just to keep it from turning into a mess, you need a certain level of uh, predictability. The predictability comes from the, the rods and a belt, which are fine for that level. But the unpredictability comes when a the, when the thing just wobbles on you and you know, the head moves one way, the bed moves another way. It's literally wobbling, mm. you know? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you go, you don't want to do the. If you do the one-sided support on a Z, I would go more than six inch bezel on that, because the cantilevering uh -huh. part, unless you reinforce more. But now I wouldn't go more than six inch beds on on the cantilever. Just support it from both sides at that point. Cause about like tiny motion. Like, um, so apparently Ultimaker is the most precise printer in terms of Z motion. They claim 20 microns, Volsbot claims 50 microns. That's the Z resolution. So think about that if you talk about kind of revol resolution, if you have a cantilevered system, the far end is going to be bubbling up and then you can hardly see it, but that will be more than like 50 microns. You know? So you're going to be just decreasing your your accuracies. Yeah, you'll have to more. Yeah, support. Yeah. Support on every side. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, yep. In the wall. I would say six inch. We did the initial eight inch on with the uh, one sided support, but um, it starts to drip on, droop, droop on you after some time. Yeah, so I was going to ask what um, sort of uses uh, do you think that those roller bearings are good for? Cause it seems like the triple logical bearings, the plastic bearing, and the 
D three D setup is is not a significant limiting factor for most. Um, I mean, mostly it's speed, right? I mean, the roller bearings that you were showing earlier, I figure they're they're unnecessary. Uh, they're unnecessary unless, here unless because. They're good for low friction, lower friction. Like, wow, you, you should see those in real life. They are just plain smooth. Like, look at some of the videos from that guy. Um, but they, it is so smooth and, and low friction. That is good. Now, one thing I was thinking was, what about uh, if you have a heavy duty, a much larger, not, not that small, not with small balls, but large size, bigger, say the bed for a heavy duty CNC mill that where the bed actually moves and you need to move a lot of weight. One application is there, but the the bushings that on two inch rods would perfectly well for that as well. So they're not critical, but I just liked it because it was an example of metal plastic composite. You got metal balls that are super strong and super smooth and that's just in plain 3D printed parts. That was the interesting part for me, just to show how when you mix plastic and, and metal together, you get some pretty interesting designs. Um, but things like conveyors, possibly, like if you have a low cost uh, linear bearing, that could be perfect for a conveyor. Let's say you got the, 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 the linear touch table that I proposed. You can have the metal feed on the bearings like that, they're super low friction. But then again, you can a 3D print your own um, rollers with uh, the bearings being in the form of planetary gear downs. Planetary gear downs can serve as wheels if you insert a rod through the middle gear. So you can Google it. You can see a lot of people using planetary gear downs, the wheel shaped ones, as for example, roller skate wheels. Okay, let's show you that one just to, to show the possibility of. Um, what we can think about in larger scale for real wheels for real machines. Um, so let me see. Let's hide this. Um, so look at th uh, three printed planetary gear roller um, skateboard wheels. Things that people jump on with all their force and they don't break. And they're tiny, they're small and plastic. So take a look at this. This kind of stuff. Hey guys, back a bit early with a fun, unique giveaway. That kind of stuff. Uh, so that's a planetary gear down. You put a rod through the, through the center and that's called a wheel. And they use that on skateboards. Amazing. And skateboards work really well and that's people jumping with hundreds of pounds of force for these wheels this tiny plastic prints so um, think of scaling this and you can have practical applications or then you scale this and then metal cast it somehow i don't know you metal cast you can't metal cast it in one piece whereas you print this in one piece so you have a fully functioning rotating wheel printed as one piece. You don't have to print the gears, internal gears, individually. You print it all as one assembly, so you have captive wheels and as planetary gear kind of structure. So where does, how does it compare to the linear? Oops. Did I lose everybody? I think I cut out, right? Just for a second. I... Did you guys see the planetary gear down wheels for? Um... Yeah. Yeah. So skateboards. Yeah, are... That's pretty interesting. So the linear bearing is a more advanced version of this, where it's lower friction, but it uses metal balls inside. But yeah, perfect technology to use for some future applications where super light surfaces are needed. So I could see like the heavy duty uh, machine bed that's got these metal balls and plastic 
parts otherwise that could be used for pretty heavy duty applications. So that would be pretty good. Okay, so let's keep moving on. We're at uh, 325 at this point. So Abe, keep on. Good work. Uh, who else has got any updates? Nathan, have a name. Nathan, no, I don't think it. Nathan. No, Jen. Oh, looks like we don't have anybody else. Jen, I think, from your, your side. No, I don't have anything going on. Yeah, you do, but that's all right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, well, I did forward a, um, somebody who's interested in helping with the project. I forwarded an email to you today about that. Yeah. Sounds okay. Good. Take a look at that. Yeah, well, this is good. Uh, so, yeah, keep going. Um, lots of exciting things happening. So, yeah, let's keep going. I'm busy with a, uh, just keeping working on the 3D printer and getting up to the some of the larger axe, axe designs, like the one inch or two inch for the torch and filament making infrastructure to be, uh, and the, the summer camp, the, just like STEM camp, more experimental, this, but we'll build 3D printers and then experiment with the one inch and two inch uh, universal axis, because that's really for the doing, and we gotta just start prototyping some of that. Maybe even if you get a the PVC printer, maybe we can prototype it as well and have it like a more experimental version of a shot around uh, here. Yeah. So, well, I think that's it for today, then. Yeah, so thanks everybody. And um, everybody else cut out. But yeah, we'll, we'll continue again on Tuesday next week, 2 p.m. CST. So thanks everybody and have a good week.